Hi, my name is uh, Jason Chen. I'm a developer advocate here at Google. Um, thank you for coming today. Uh, I am here to talk about, uh, a, give a talk called How Do I Code Thee? Let Me Count the Ways. I know this is the end of a very long day, so I appreciate all of you uh, coming to hear me speak. So what I wanted to talk about today, um, but before I get into that, <clears throat> I think we should talk a little bit about what Android is, um, just to give some context. And you know, undoubtedly, you've, if you've looked at Android at all, you've seen uh, this layer cake um, that starts with the Linux kernel, and then includes libraries, and then includes uh, the runtime and the application framework and applications themselves. Um, but you know what? This is something we've talked about for over a year, and I'm tired of talking about this particular slide. So we won't talk about this today. Um, instead, what I want to talk about is a different way of thinking about what Android is for you as application developers. So first, let's ask the question, what is Android? In some ways, Android is a chunk of code for making phone calls. It's something that lets you uh, take a phone, a smartphone, and uh, call any number um, that you'd like to call. It's pretty simple, right? Android's also a robust network stack and internet client. It's something that <clears throat> makes your uh, smartphone or the device that it's running on a uh, true internet client. And the third thing that Android is that's of interest to you as developers is that it's a platform for running code. And what do I mean by that? I mean that Android is an application platform, <clears throat> so it accepts and it enables you as developers to run, to create and then run your applications um, as you'd like. But we didn't really, as Google uh, and as the Open Handset Alliance, we didn't create Android to try to control or own mobile. What we wanted was a modern, efficient, and powerful software stack for mobile devices. And to that end, Android is a framework uh, for creating and having components from various applications interact with one another. For you as a developer, this means that apps can pull pieces in from other applications, uh, even include the web, or in some cases, even include native code. And as we talk today, um, I will talk about all three of these possibilities. So let's unpack a little bit more about what I mean by a platform for run, and sorry. And when I, when I mentioned that we'll, you could, we'll talk about all three things, what I want to say, or what I want to emphasize is really that um, we, Android as a platform, uh, wants uh, and is capable of running all three types, um, and we don't pass any judgment about um, how you build your app. So an agenda. Um, what do I want to talk about today? First, I'll introduce the three different kinds of Android app, uh, of ways you can create Android applications. After that, I'll demonstrate um, how to use each of those three application development methods. And then I'll give you some statistics uh, and some comparisons so you can better understand how each technique can be used and what might be right for your situation. And then to wrap up, I'll talk a little bit about um, future directions for each development method. What I won't talk about today is how, teach you how to write an application. I won't talk again about what's things that are covered elsewhere. And most of all, I won't pass judgment, meaning I'll talk about things and I'll give you the pros and cons, uh, but I'm not out to tell you that there's only one way to write applications. So the three delicious flavors. Let's talk about um, what they look like and uh, get into some of the details. Currently, 
there's three different kinds of Android code. The first is managed code. Uh, this is a, a picture of uh, a town in the country of Iceland called Dalvik. Dalvik, if you know anything about Android, also happens to be the name of the virtual machine um, upon which your code will run. It happens to be called Dalvik because the tech lead who worked on uh, the virtual machine has uh, some ancestry in Iceland and thought that Dalvik was a neat name. So that's managed code. The second type is Ajax. Uh, Ajax, if you, uh, many of you are probably familiar, uh, involves JavaScript, uh, CSS, and HTML, uh, and is a way that you can create dynamic applications uh, in a web browser. And the third kind of code is native code. Um, and that's an arm because uh, currently Android runs, uh, the devices that Android runs on are based on ARM processors. And native code is code that you'd write in C or C++ and compile down into uh, binary uh, that would run on that particular processor. So let's talk a little bit about Dalvik code. But actually, before we do, um, we should figure out an example. We need an example um, that's interesting and computationally significant. Um, so it'll be something that uh, will show the various differences between the three methods we're going to talk about. It must be something that I can externalize so that I can uh, write it both in uh, Java to run on Dalvik, write it in JavaScript so that it can run in the browser, and also write it in native code so that we can uh, have it run uh, on, the, uh, on the ARM processor as well. And also, since you know, I like pretty pictures, it should make for at least an interesting visualization. Um, so we can put some colors up on the screen. So an example, so what we settled on um, in thinking about our example um, was an algorithm called k-means clustering. And at a high level, um, what this algorithm does is it helps you ident identify clusters of, in a set of points. So it helps you figure out, OK, which points are kind of related? Um, and we'll do a simple one where we'll take maybe 500 randomly generated points and we'll divide them up into six different groups, um, each labeled by a color. Um, and that way it'll be easy to see on the screen. And uh, we can do all three uh, implementations, again, in Dalvik using 100% Java uh, source code. Um, we'll implement that same algorithm in C um, to get our native code implementation. And then we'll do it again in JavaScript. So k-means clustering and like really quickly at a high level um, looks like this. Basically, you have a, a set of points. Uh, you divide those points into groups, and then you divide them again by computing uh, the center of those points. Um, the Wikipedia article can tell you way more about it than I can in, in a minute. Um, but eventually, what we hope to end up with is something like this up on screen, uh, which is just a visualization of these points uh, colored by the group that they're in. OK, so now back to Dalvik code. At a high level, Dalvik is a virtual machine. Uh, it's similar to the JVM or the .NET CLR. Uh, it's memory protected, it's garbage collected, and it's lifecycle managed. Um, and it's really been designed from the ground up uh, for embedded devices. And uh, one way that we've optimized it for embedded devices is that Dalvik implements a register-based system instead of a stack-based uh, virtual machine. Um, and all of these efforts to optimize Dalvik um, is in effort to reduce the need for a just-in-time compiler. In addition, we've also, uh, Dalvik runs a custom bytecode format called DEX. And the way that we get DEX code, bytecode, is uh, by translating Java code, a Java bytecode. Um, and that translator is included in the SDK. If you've done any uh, application development already, um, you may have seen an application called DEX. That's the tool that we use to convert Java bytecode into Dalvik bytecode. So when you write your app 
to run on Dalvik. Um, they get access to all the core framework APIs. Um, and these APIs can be things um, that range from things like OpenGL or the binder um, for inter-process communication. Um, or they can be something like the media framework or the UI toolkit, widget toolkit. Some of these APIs are backed by native code, things like OpenGL and, and the media framework, uh, because attempting to do all of them, in uh, all of it in Java, or excuse me, in Dalvik, in a, would be too slow. Um, so we call out, the framework calls out using JNI uh, to this native code. Another reason we chose, um, or with Dalvik, and applications that you write on Dalvik, um, because you write them using the Java programming language, you can use your uh, favorite Java tools. Um, and to that end, we've written an Eclipse plugin to help you uh, write your, app, your Android applications. And what does that look like? Uh, the Eclipse plugin looks like this. Um, and you'll see a little bit more of this later when I demo uh, the Eclipse plugin. So if you choose Dalvik, what can you do? Well, um, you can build a lot of rich UIs uh, because you have access to the native widget toolkit. You can also have parts of your application run as background services so they can run invisibly in the background while other applications are running. You can also uh, create and get access to shared components uh, so other parts of the system uh, that you'd, you'd like to take advantage of, you can from your Dalvik-based application. And you get very close integration with system events and the UI. Um, and there are, uh, there are, there's other material that covers a lot of this in detail, um, so I won't get into uh, much more of this here. What can't you do with Dalvik? There's not much. Dalvik is uh, really the primary application platform. Um, it's the crossroads for a lot of, for the other two techniques that we'll talk about later. Um, but it doesn't mean necessarily that it's right for you. If you need all out raw speed for your application, then maybe you might need native code. And if you don't need um, tight integration with the rest of the system, maybe you can get away with writing your application in Ajax. And we'll explore those possibilities later. Uh, but right now what I want to do is give you a demo of what um, a Dalvik implementation of that k-means clustering algorithm looks like. So I'll jump out of this, and I will jump into Eclipse. Uh, and so you can see here, um, I've got a couple of things open, uh, but I've got a project where I've built um, some source code. I have uh, resources where I've created my layouts, and um, included an icon. Um, and a couple of the things that you'll find interesting here is the Dalvik cluster. So this is, um, this is the implementation of the, that k-means clustering algorithm that I talked about. Uh, I've written it all in, um, we've written it all here in Java, and we'll run natively in Dalvik. So we've got that. Uh, we've also got some other bits. So we've, um, it actually, the Dalvik cluster actually implements a uh, cluster interface. Um, so, and that'll come in handy later, which I'll explain. Um, and then we do this uh, computation in a background thread. Uh, so this is, uh, so this is that, that. Now what I'll do is I will uh, fire this up. And we will run this on a device that I have connected here. Um, and then what I'll do is that'll install this. And we will see here on the phone that I have, as the installation finishes, you'll see that the screen starts to get filled with uh, these colored, pretty, pretty colored points, which means the algorithm is running. And if you can see up in the upper left, you'll see numbers flash by. Those are the... Um, total time it took to run that pass of the algorithm. And then the top number um, is the amount of time it took to render 
that particular um, frame. So now we see that you know, we've been able to implement this particular uh, algorithm. Uh, and uh, that's kind of what it looks like in general at a high level to write a, a Dalvik application. You use uh, Eclipse, runs on the phone, um, and it's all written in, Java, in the Java programming language. So we'll back to the slides here. Now, what are some exam other examples of uh, Dalvik apps? Because that's not terribly interesting, but um, we have uh, other apps, such as the core system apps, like the dialer, um, that are written in Java uh, and in the Java language and run in on Dalvik. Um, another app, um, all of the other apps that are on Android Market, almost all of them are written uh, solely in Dalvik. Uh, an example of which is up here. This is a uh, SkyMap. It's a pretty cool application uh, that lets you look at the constellations and tells you uh, which constellations might be uh, overhead right now. So where are we going in the future with Dalvik? Well, first of all, uh, we are working on improving garbage collection so that it's faster uh, and better. In addition, uh, we have started work on just-in-time compilation for your applications. Um, and then, on top of that, uh, we will continue to optimize uh, the core libraries so that the basic infrastructure that you use uh, every day with your app Dalvik applications will continue to get better and run faster over time. And then, of course, we will also add additional APIs uh, as new functionality becomes available uh, to use as developers. Things like Bluetooth, peer-to-peer uh, -peer messaging, uh, and others. So that's Dalvik. Let's talk next a little bit about Ajax apps. Since you're all here at Google Developer Day, I'm sure many of you are, are aware of how and what an Ajax app is. Um, with, at a really high level, Ajax apps, Ajax apps are uh, written using a combination of JavaScript, uh, HTML, and CSS. And the JavaScript is used to uh, manipulate what's called a DOM and uh, to create UI effects. And also, uh, recently, with HTML5, things like uh, Canvas allow for more direct rendering of, um, to, the, to the screen. So Ajax apps on Android. What do those look like? Well, Android's browser is powered by a combination of WebKit and Squirrelfish. WebKit is the rendering engine that runs um, also on things like uh, Apple's Safari browser. And currently, the version of WebKit that we're using is 5.28.5. It's equivalent to Safari 4. Um, we do have a minor bug in that we report the Android browser's user agent string to be 3.12, when it really should be 4.0, and we'll fix that. In addition to WebKit and Squirrelfish, we also uh, include Gears uh, 0 0.517, uh, which gives access to things like location uh, in, uh, to Ajax apps. And finally, it also uh, includes support for the Canvas tag. So you can do some direct drawing to the screen. So with all of this in, in this environment, what can you do? Well, one thing is you could um, just write static web pages, um, which there's nothing wrong with, but um, seems, you know, it's fairly simple. You can also build dynamic UIs using uh, DOM or Canvas. And you can fetch and store your data on a, on a server. And eventually, uh, once Android supports HTML5, uh, you'll be able to uh, get access to things like the user's current location. You can run co uh, code in a background thread. And you can also locally store uh, data and pages as well. If you use Ajax to build your application for Android, there are a couple things you can't do. Well, currently, 
Uh, Android does not support HTML5, uh, but it does support Gears. So you get some of the features that are coming in HTML5. You also don't get background processing. Uh, code that your AJAX code will only run when the browser is open and your page is loaded. Um, so if the user is doing something else, your AJAX app will not continue to run. And the other thing that you won't get access to is uh, the system and framework APIs. Now, <clears throat> that's true for the most part, but there is an exception. And I'll talk about that a little bit later in my talk. So hang on to that. But what I want to show right now is a quick example uh, of that same k-means clustering algorithm implemented in JavaScript. So I'll jump out of here. And we'll go over to this. And I will open my demo. And I will show you a couple of these files. So you can see this is um, just a simple uh, HTML page. Um, we load some JavaScript, and we define a canvas for our, the JavaScript to draw on. Uh, and then we call the draw call from the JavaScript. And that JavaScript looks something like this. Um, it's essentially the same uh, algorithm that we implemented in Java for the Dalvik application, uh, but this time done in JavaScript, so using some of the uh, JavaScript um, syntax and, and features. So we'll cluster and we'll do those same things. So what will this look like? Well, let's jump back over to um, the phone. And this time I will fire up the browser. And by default it goes to Google. But conveniently, I have my demo page bookmarked. So as we load, you can see that this is that same HTML page, or same algorithm loaded up in the browser, and uh, rendering uh, in the browser and doing that same sort of visualization. Um, what you can't see on the screen, but I can see on my phone, is that the numbers that show how long this took um, are a little bit are significantly higher uh, than uh, with Dalvik. And you don't have to worry about the specific numbers. I'll talk about that um, towards the end of my talk. So that's just an example of um, AJAX apps. We'll jump back over to this. So what are some examples of some AJAX applications that run uh, on Android? Um, and there are a few. Um, one that I'll up here is the Google Reader for mobile application. That's an AJAX app that runs in the browser. There's also the, the web version of Gmail that run, also runs uh, here in the Android browser. And there are many, many other web apps uh, that have been optimized for WebKit uh, for um, other mobile web browsers that happen to also uh, run, run WebKit. So what is the future for AJAX apps on Android? Uh, well, like you've heard with to this morning with HTML5, um, HTML5 will continue to get better. And eventually, uh, and in the future, uh, Android will incorporate HTML5 directly into the browser so that you don't have to use Gears. We also have plans to upgrade to an even faster JavaScript virtual machine so that uh, your, the performance of your JavaScript uh, will improve as well. But there's something else that you can do uh, with AJAX on Android. And it's a technique that I like to call augmented AJAX. And let me explain. On Android, one thing that you can do is you can have a Dalvik-based application that includes Java objects and also has a web view. And a web view is simply uh, a container 
uh, that runs the same uh, view as the browser does for rendering HTML. And what you can do in this Dalvik application is you can provide a bridge between your uh, Java objects and the JavaScript that executes in your web view um, so that you can end up with uh, what you can, something that you can consider a super Ajax, right? Something that's been augmented and whose powers have been increased. And really what you're doing here is you're injecting functionality into your JavaScript. So you're taking Java objects, any ob object that runs in your Dalvik-based application, and exposing that to the web view that's in, also in that Dalvik application so that your JavaScript can get access to it. So that was the Ajax technique. Let's talk a little bit about native code. Native code on Android is launched as a Dalvik application. You can include a native or a dynamic library um, in your Dalvik-based app. And what your code running in Dalvik will do is call to your native code uh, using JNI to do the heavy lifting. So these uh, shared object uh, files are created using something called the NDK or the Native Development Kit, um, which will be, uh, which is underway uh, and being developed, but not quite available yet uh, for you as developers. But it is something that's available in the open source branch if you'd like to get an early look uh, at what we're planning. With native code, what can you do? Well, you can do things like physics simulations. Uh, you can quickly load large data files. Generally, you can do things that are speed um, intensive, perhaps maybe something like a lookup for an IME because you're uh, sensitive to the time it takes for it to complete. You could maybe also write a custom virtual machine. Um, there's often many uh, obsolete old games that run in their own virtual machine uh, that could uh, make use of the native code. You could also do some unsupported things. Um, right now, the only, or our plan is to provide access to libc and libm for native code. And technically, there are other libraries, uh, but we don't make any guarantees about their compatibility uh, or their continued uh, accessibility uh, by your application. So if you use them, use them with caution, uh, because if your application breaks and you get bad ratings on market, um, that's, uh, that's a risk that you uh, undertake by using APIs that are not officially supported. So what can't you do with native? Like I mentioned, the current set of APIs available to native code is limited to libc and libm. We expect to add more over time, uh, but currently that's, uh, that's all you get. The other thing you can't do from native code is to hack the system. Even though you're running as native code, the same sandbox that protects the system from your app and your app from other apps in the system still applies. So now that I've talked a little bit about native, let me give you a quick demo uh, about what native code looks like uh, on uh, using our example. So we'll jump out of my slides and we'll jump over here and we'll, yep, there we go. So you might have seen that in addition to the Dalvik cluster, I also have this class here called nativecluster.java. And this is, um, if you've, and this is probably familiar to any of you who've ever written uh, JNI code. This is basically a proxy uh, that call, makes this call here called system.loadlibrary and loads a, uh, a native library that I've compiled. 
What that native library looks like is this. This native library is written in C um, and uh, is, again, an, a third implementation of that k-means clustering algorithm that we talked about earlier. And um, you know, has all the idiosyncrasies of C, uh, but essentially does uh, exactly the same computation uh, that we did with JavaScript earlier, as well as Java. So that's what that looks like. Uh, if we close this. So we're back here in Eclipse. What I'm going to do is jump to this k-means view class. And you'll see here, let me minimize this so you can see all of my code, um, that we, this is where we uh, instantiate the Dalvik cluster. But since we don't want to do the, com the computation in Dalvik, what we'll do is change this to native cluster, save this. And then we'll go back up here and we will compile this application and run it on my phone again. <coughs> and what you'll see in just a second is the same uh, algorithm running and the same visualization running. Uh, what you'd notice if you could see the colors up there in the corner, maybe if I cover, there we go. Uh, the numbers are actually um, a little bit lower uh, because we are running that very <coughs> intensive algorithm in native code. So we will, so that's what uh, writing and running a native code application looks like at a high level. So we'll jump back to this. So what can you do with native code? There's a couple of things. Um, you know, some examples are there's an app um, available that runs the Scum VM, and the Scum VM was one of those obsolete game virtual machines, uh, and they've implemented that in native code. There's a music streaming application called Spotify that uses native code as well uh, for some of their managing their music streams. Um, and a lot of the system is actually written in native code uh, and uh, where it needs to be exposed to Dalvik applications um, binds to the Android framework by using JNI. So where are we going in the future with native code? Well, we're, going to, we're planning on adding additional libraries, um, but it's open-ended as to which ones. So if you have any thoughts or requests, please let us know um, so that we can make an informed decision about which additional libraries we can make available to you as developers. Where we what we won't do in the future is make native code a fully independent application model. Um, what that means is that we don't want, uh, you won't be able to create applications only using native code. But that doesn't mean that there's a, there's, but that means there's no reason, uh, we have no reason to prevent developers from doing things. So if you need access to particular libraries, again, please let us know. So really quickly, um, I wanna give you a, a bonus demo, um, which I can show. Uh, one of the things that I talked about earlier was that uh, with Ajax apps on Android, you don't get any access to system libraries or the framework APIs. Well, that's true by default, and especially if you run in, um, in the browser. But if you use that augmented Ajax technique that I talked about earlier, you can actually get access to, um, this, uh, to, to framework or system APIs uh, through Dalvik. 
And as a bonus, what I'm going to do is, um, is the following. We are going to actually run, create an augmented AJAX app that, run, that does the same k-means clustering algorithm, but that clustering algorithm will be run in native code. And the way that we're going to do that is the following. We have this k-means web view activity. This web view activity loads, um, loads the web view uh, that we've created that uh, will execute the JavaScript. But the JavaScript is different because the JavaScript here, you'll see I'm calling index2.html, which is a different page that we created. And what it does is it makes a call to a specific cluster object. And that cluster object is something that we are going to expose uh, via this web view activity. So the way I'm going to make this change is I'm going to open the manifest. We're going to change this attribute from k-means activity to k-means web view activity. Save that. And what we'll do is we will go over. And again, remember, uh, we are going to compile. Go here. Click this. Go back to my uh, phone here. And you'll see as soon as it gets installed, that this looks like our, um, our JavaScript implementation. But if you could see the numbers on the screen, um, it would show you that it's running much faster. And that's because we're using native code. So that's a really quick uh, demo of how you can go all the way from JavaScript code and include native code in your application all on Android. And if you're worried or want to see more about this, uh, I'll have a URL at the end of my talk where you can get all of the code that I showed here um, as open source. So really quickly, because they're telling me I have about 10 minutes left, let's talk about how you choose. Well, here's some data. And one thing I want you to pay attention to is the rendering time. And you can see uh, there's a big difference between using JavaScript and Dalvik and native in terms of uh, rendering time for this particular algorithm. You'll also notice that the percent render uh, makes it, uh, is significantly uh, different as well. You'll see that in Dalvik, the amount of time spent rendering is uh, small, uh, but the overall runtime um, is large. And with native code, um, you see that it's 11%, but the overall time uh, is actually much faster, or uh, several times faster to complete than Dalvik. So what does this mean? Well, for one thing, it means that Dalvik is very competitive with other pure interpreted virtual machines. And Dalvik as a front end for native code usually beats JavaScript. Right? It's more efficient to use Dal go from Dalvik into native than it is to go from all the way from JavaScript through Dalvik down into native. But there are some cases where this doesn't matter. So again, it's up to you to think about and figure out what's right for your particular application. One other conclusion, of course, is that custom native code will almost always win the speed test. So how do we make this decision, right? So it's kind of, it might be a little complicated. So I decided to create a uh, flowchart to help you, help guide your decision making. And so on this flowchart, the first question you should ask is, well, do you have an existing website? And if the answer is yes, is it an Ajax website? And if it is, does it have a REST service? And if it is an Ajax, well, why not? I mean, you should make it ajax -y, right? Because that's what we've been talking about here all day. And if you do, then you'll probably end up with a REST service, right? 
And if you don't have a website, well, um, do you need a website? You should ask. And if yes, then you'll probably end up with a REST service because you'll want to make it AJAX. But if you don't need a website, well, does your app need to be really fast? And if no, then maybe you can use AJAX. But if yes, well, seriously, does it need to be really, really fast? And yeah, if, if so, OK, fine. You can use native code, right? But if not, that's what I thought, right? So you could you know, use Dalvik. And if you want to use AJAX, well, do you need tight integration with the system? Then maybe you should use Dalvik instead. But if you don't, then, and you do, maybe you can use augmented AJAX. And if you don't want to use native, or a Dalvik, or maybe not even AJAX, well, hold on. Wait, wait a second. What languages do you even know, right? Do you know C, C++? Do you know Java? Do you know a JavaScript? And if you do, then maybe you use AJAX. And if you know Java, then maybe you use Dalvik. And if you know C, then maybe you use native code. And if you don't, um, well, maybe, uh, hold on. Um, haven't we seen this before? And we have. And I think I have a headache, because this is way too complicated. And I, here's what the bottom line really is, right? And that was really a joke, right? I, you know, I think the bottom line here, and the, what I want to tell you today is this. There's more than one way to do Android applications. I'm not here to tell you that you know, there's one particular way to write your applications. It's up to you to help figure out. And my job here today is to help you understand the pros and cons of the various ways to do things. So to summarize, really, the center or the centroid of your app can really be anywhere. And remember that things like Dalvik apps can embed the web, and web apps can call into Dalvik. Apps can also include native code, in, native code to increase performance where it's needed. And really the bottom line is you have to understand what your app needs and decide what's best for you. If you're using a lot of drawing, maybe you use Dalvik. If you have a web pre presence, maybe you used Ajax or augmented Ajax. And if you have large, slow algorithms, maybe you think about using Dalvik and native code. And finally, remember, you know, the languages and the skills that you have mean something. So you should go with what you know. So that's pretty much the long and the short of it. I have about five minutes left. Um, so I want to open it up for questions. Um, and, but before we do, I'll point out two things. Uh, the first is that the source that I showed today is available at that URL. Uh, and you can learn more about Android uh, in general at developer.android.com. So thank you, and uh, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to take them. Um, we have microphone, people with microphones, so please raise your hand, uh, and I'll be happy to take them. Hey. Does system uh, verify uh, native code? I'm sorry? Can you please? 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 No, it does not verify in the way that it would with Dalvik or Dex code. Um, but what you can do and what the resource system does is um, you can compile your native code for various application, uh, sorry, processor uh, frameworks. So you could compile for ARM and also compile for x86. And the resource framework would know what type of um, processor architecture you're running on and will execute or provide you the correct 
system library when you make that call to system.load library. Any other questions? Up front? ネイティブライブラリーについてご質問します、えー、今後ですねアンドロイドマーケットなどを通じて、えー、アプリケーションと同時にアプリケーションで用いる、えー、ネイティブライブラリーも同時にこうダウンロードできるようなことっていうのは、まあ、今後想定されていますでしょうか um, So Android Market、uh, does not check to see if native code is included、uh, We don't care with Android Market、uh, whether or not you use native code Um, and so, it, you know, if you want to use it today, you can. We don't have an official way for you to include native code with your applications yet,、um, but it's coming.、Um, and the other thing that Android Market will do is it will, if your application uses native code, it will、um, only show the, your app to devices that use the same. Compatible processor architecture. So that way, we don't try to、uh, maybe give your ARM based application、uh, to an x86 based device. Okay, one more question. Sure. And,、uh, so, native no library jitai wo. えー、後からダウンロードしてくるということは想定されておりますでしょうか、um, ?I think your question was about、uh, what other libraries might be available、uh, to native code.Is that correct?Yes.Things、um, that we're thinking about、uh, might be access to OpenGL、uh, or perhaps、uh, Other,、um, you know, like OpenAL or audio language.、Um, so we're looking at a variety of things. I think the closest、uh, next thing would be OpenGL. But we'd love to hear any other suggestions that you might have. Thank you. Any other questions? Again in the front. えっと、ちょっとここで聞く質問ではないのかもしれないんですけども、例えば、えー、Linux カーネルに機能、例えば Linux カーネルモジュールで追加をしたいなんていうときには、えー、この Android 側としては、なんかこう、どのように追加すればいいというようなガイドラインとか、まあ多分 Android の外になってしまうのかもしれないんですが、そういったことっていうのは何か想定されているでしょうか。So, your question is about whether or not、um, you can include a、uh, Linux kernel modification、uh, with your application.、Uh, so, hi. And the answer is, is、um, you can't.、Um, the part of the challenge, if we did allow for that, would be security,、uh, because if you can alter the kernel, Uh, then you could undermine、um, the sandbox that we've put into place for applications. So, unfortunately, it's not something that you would be able to do、uh, via a downloaded application. Now, if you had a developer phone, you could take the open source tree and modify Android as, you'd like to, as you would like, and then install it on your phone.、Um, but I don't foresee a future where you could install.、Uh, Linux kernel mo modifications after the fact. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay, well, thank you very much. I will、uh, be here afterwards if you'd like to ask me any questions in person. <laughs>